Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless are we the final generation there is one main event in bible prophecy that had to happen to usher in the time that the bible calls the last days and that event happened on may 14 1948 just as the prophet isaiah foretold isaiah 66 8 who has heard such a thing who has seen such things shall the earth be made to give birth in one day or shall a nation be born at once for as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. On the evening of May 14, 1948, at precisely 4 p.m., the members of the People's Council in Israel signed the proclamation and the declaration was made that the State of Israel is established. This meeting is adjourned. Israel not only became a nation, but also was literally brought forth as a nation in one day. The Establishment of Israel in 1947, the Palestine question came before the General Assembly of the United Nations. The Arabs of Palestine cannot go into any political discussion on the basis of any Jewish state in Palestine. Surely the Jewish people is no less deserving than other peoples. Are the Arabs responsible for that problem? Have they acted or worked or helped in creating such a problem? The Jewish people were your allies in the war and join their sacrifices to yours to achieve a common victory. The admission of the applicant, if taken, would be the highest con consummation of injustice. Argentina, Palestine, France, yes. The resolution was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. On May 14, 1948, the British government terminated its Palestine mandate, and on May 15, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared the independent state of Israel. Eastward, the Arab Legion poised for invasion on the Transjordan border. King Abdullah reviewed a brigade of reinforcements from Iraq. Immediately, a coalition of armies from Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Lebanon invaded the new Jewish state. The war was marked by long periods of fighting and temporary ceasefires, with hostilities officially ending in January 1949. At that time, Israel held 5,600 square miles of territory allotted in the UN partition plan, plus an additional 2,500 square miles, while Transjordan held the eastern sector of Jerusalem and the West Bank, and Egypt held the Gaza Strip. The Muslim states refused to negotiate peace or recognize Israel's right to exist, and remained in a state of war with Israel. Islam's Jewish problem reemerges. Muslims reacted to the Jewish victory with shock. It caused a theological challenge of the greatest scope imaginable. Islamic-Jewish military conflict had now reoccurred with opposite results. While the Muslims of the first Ummah in Medina had defeated the Jews, the Jews had now achieved political independence, overcome Muslims in battle, 
and ruled over Muslims in a land that was taken by Dar al-Islam at the outset of the great conquests. The Jews were known to be weak, cowardly, impure, and condemned by God to humiliation. Such people were not supposed to defeat them. A Jewish state was the ultimate insult and degradation, whereby protectors became tributaries, and tributaries became protectors. While Islam's initial victory over the Jews in the time of Muhammad was a sign of coming conquests and divine vindication, it was feared their defeat by the Jews might signal the final demise after a decline of 300 years. Hence, Muslims considered the founding of the state of Israel to be a Nakba, a catastrophe of historic proportions. Jesus talked about this fulfilled prophecy in Matthew 24, 32 through 35. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. There are two obvious questions concerning this parable. Who or what is the fig tree? And how long is a generation? The answer to the first question is unmistakably Israel. God clearly compares Israel with the fig tree. Hosea 9.10 I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. Here God compares Israel to grapes and the fathers to fruits of the fig tree. Joel 1, 6 and 7 For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Joel speaks of my land as being comparable to my fig tree, again showing that Israel ethnically, nationally, and geographically is symbolized as a fig tree. How long is a generation? Psalm 9010. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. The generation spoken of here must be the generation that would see all the things that Jesus spoke of when the disciples questioned him about the signs of his coming and the end of the age. Specifically, it would be the generation that would see the fig tree budding. Since we know that the fig tree is Israel, then this generation must be the one that began at the commencement of the new state of Israel in 1948. Matthew 21, 19 And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. We see Israel was a dried up fig tree for about 1900 years. And then miraculously the branch put forth leaves in one day on May 14, 1948. Jesus told us that when this happens his return is at the doors as we read in Matthew 24, 33. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Jesus went on to say that the generation that saw this would by no means pass away as we read in Matthew 24, 34. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. A generation is the lifetime of a person, and that is on average between 70 and 80 years. Thus, according to Psalm 9010, we could write out an equation concerning the rapture and Jesus' second coming in the following manner. 1948, the year Israel became a nation, plus a 70-year lifespan, equals the year 2018, minus the seven-year tribulation, equals the rapture occurring in the year 2011. Or if by reason of strength, 1948, the year Israel became a nation, plus a 80-year lifespan, equals the year 2028, minus the seven-year tribulation, equals a rapture occurring no later than the year 2021. So if this theory is correct, the pre-tribulation rapture and the start of the seven-year tribulation will occur this year. We have seen that the biblical interpretation of the fig tree is clearly Israel. We have also seen that a generation is the lifetime of a person which according to Psalm 90.10 is between 70 and 80 years. Whether or not the Lord is required to return within 80 years of Israel becoming a nation, we obviously cannot be dogmatic. Nevertheless, in light of the incredible accuracy of His first coming, we ought to take heed that these dates are both reasonable and likely. The Lord's second coming, therefore, appears to be in 2028. The beginning of the seven-year tribulation subtracts seven years then would most likely commence in 2021. Remember the Apostle Paul said we are to know the times and the seasons. Yet Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour. The Lord's second coming between 2018 and 2028 is seemingly the time and the season 
but is not predictive of the day or the hour. The world, and even a big part of the church, is fast asleep to the reality of Jesus' soon return. Jesus gave the church a dire warning to be watchful for his return in Revelation 3.3. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... Jesus emphasized the importance of prayer as we watch in Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Prophecy is like putting together a puzzle, and God will not reveal how and when the pieces will be put in place until He is ready. If the rapture does not occur this year, don't be disheartened. It just means this theory was wrong, and we need to keep trying to figure out the prophecy puzzle because we are definitely in the season of the Lord's return. When is the rapture going to happen in relation to the tribulation? The timing of the rapture in relation to the tribulation is one of the most controversial issues in the church today. There are four views on the timing of the rapture. The pre-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs before the tribulation starts. The pre-wrath view, where the rapture happens before the great day of wrath in Revelation 6, 17. The mid-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs at or near the midpoint of the tribulation, and the post-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation. The primary scripture passage on the rapture is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. It states that all living believers, along with all believers who have died, will meet the Lord Jesus in the air and will be with him forever. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. A few verses later, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord, Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, which deals primarily with the time period of the tribulation, is a prophetic message of how God will pour out His wrath upon an unbelieving and unrepentant world. It seems inconsistent for God to promise believers that they will not suffer wrath and then leave them on the earth to suffer through His anger during the tribulation. Another passage on the timing of the rapture is in Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Christ promises to deliver believers from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole earth. This could mean two things. Either Christ will protect believers in the midst of the trials, or he will deliver believers out of the trials. It is important to recognize what believers are promised to be kept from. It is not just the trial, but the hour of trial. Christ is promising to keep believers from a specific time period that contains the trials, namely, the tribulation. The purpose of the tribulation, the purpose of the rapture, the meaning of 1 Thessalonians 5.9, and the interpretation of Revelation 3.10 all give clear support to the pre-tribulation position. If the Bible is interpreted literally and consistently, the pre-tribulation position is the most biblically based interpretation. Another good reason for a pre-tribulation rapture is the tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble as we read in Jeremiah. 37. Alas, for that day is great. 
so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. The tribulation is primarily for the salvation of the Jewish nation of Israel, as God renames Jacob Israel, as we read in Genesis 32, 28. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. After the rapture, the age of grace has ended, and God shifts his focus back to the Jews as he promised to save a remnant of them, as we read in Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, This is my people, and each one will say, The Lord is my God. The coming seven-year tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation, in which the Jewish people will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They will receive Yeshua as their Messiah, and they will cry out, Baruch haba b'shem Adne, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Whatever we believe about the timing of the rapture, there are two realities all Christians must keep in mind. First, no difference of opinion among Christians justifies unkindness or hostility toward those who hold different views. Jesus commands us to love one another, just as he loved us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15, 12. Jesus also said that by our love for one another, all people would know that we are his disciples, as we read in John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Wrangling and name-calling over issues such as the timing of the rapture does not exhibit Christ's love. 1 Timothy 6, 3-5 If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Hebrews 10, 23-25 Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Brothers and sisters, no matter what our view may be on the timing of the rapture, we must exhort one another as we see the day of the Lord approaching. Don't be left behind, except Jesus today. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. 
Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself. As we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8-9 declares, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. through But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, 
but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready.